what do you know about fashion design? If you know, then you must have heard of this term. Uh, and let me get this right. Anthropometric. Yes, anthropometric. Never heard of it before? Well, you are in the right space there. A very good evening, my lovely friends. Uh, my name is Warren and welcome to the Warren Chanmugam Show. Today, Wednesday, 21st of July. Can you beat that? What a lovely day. And for a lovely day, we have a lovely person. You know, we, we feature inspiring individuals in this show. And tonight, we have Satu Lagi Perempuan. Yes, she's a scholar in this field of fashion design, founder of Clotec Atelier Academy, clothing technologies trainer and consultant. She has coached many fashion business owners. She has written many books and white papers, awards, recognitions, and many more. And she is a woman. Ladies and gentlemen, honor indeed is mine to introduce to you Datin Dr. Nosaada Zakaria. Ma'am, hi there. Hi. We are live, ma'am. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I'm good. I'm good. Very nice. I uh, hope your family is fine. Uh, they are all good. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, thank you so much for visiting us uh, in this Warren Shanmugam show, ma'am. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and... Uh, to be able to, you know, to be given a chance and opportunity to share whatever that I have done uh, so far. Uh, thank you to you, Warren. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. So uh, this is a, a show uh, for people uh, like you. Uh, this is the description that I want to share. People like you who have gone through struggles, challenges, but yet determined to be different and have desired to achieve something in life. We talk to them here and get our viewers inspired. We have enough negative messages flying around out there, Datin. So here, we talk about uh, the light that is at the very end of the tunnel. And our motto is very simple and only one. I am more than I think. Remember that you can do so much more than you think you could. So do follow us, ladies and gentlemen, in our Facebook page. If you want to know more about us and the programs that we do, I am more than I think. Click like, click share. So, Datin, let's get going, shall we? Sure, sure. Datin, uh, your childhood, uh, how was it? Uh, we want to know, how was your growing up? And also your teenage life, ma'am. Could you share uh, a little about uh, that? Okay. Um, actually, this will be my first time sharing my, my, my childhood. Eh? I've never actually uh, revealed anything. Uh, was not given a chance, but I think this is the best chance to talk about how I grew up. I my parents came from Kedah, yeah? Kedah, and um, they are all. I mean, like they had been in in the hometown for a long time until my father decided to come to KL to work and brought my mother, who was never, you know, had the chance to visit the city. She was all the way in Kampung. So when they came in the 60s, yeah, they came directly to Kuala Lumpur, you know, the vibrant city. And my mother had, you know, like a, had a dream, you know, like I want to stay in the city, you know, being in the kampung for so long. And my mother uh, was a real kampung girl, you know, and she, but she has a very, how do I say, a high spirit to become somebody. That's what I know about her in you know, all my life. And she was always talking about, you know, like one day I will be somebody, you know, and I want to go somewhere. And when my father came to the rescue to bring her out, you know, from the village to the city, she was very excited. Um, and they came and stayed in Kuala Lumpur. And when they got us, yeah, I was the second child out of eight. Um, they moved to another vibrant city then in the 70s. It was PJ. I'm sure you know PJ, right? Yes, indeed. I know. <laughs> so in 70s, Petaling Jaya was the city, you know, like everybody will stay there instead of Kuala Lumpur because Kuala Lumpur was like too, you know, uh, too big. But uh, Petaling Jaya is just a nice city to grow up, you know. So we, I, I spent the whole of my life, actually, younger life, uh, in Pelanjaya. Uh, I was schooled there. Um, and uh, the school that we went at that time was one of the elite schools in Pelanjaya. We have all the elite people and we have all races there. 
we have all sort of status there you know from the lowest to the highest but mostly people there are you know people who earn well and educated so i was there uh, among them and my father was working in kl eh? he was like going back and forth to kuala lumpur he was stationed in felda headquarters i think felda was in somewhere around datuk kramat right yes That yes big one i'm sure you know because you also grow up in gomba <laughs> So um, he wanted us, yeah, the children, to have a different life, you know. And he said at that time, I was asking him yeah, lately, I said, why you were working in Kuala Lumpur and then why did you move to Kaling Jaya? And it was a new residential, you know. We were there around, uh, you know, uh, PJ Section 14. It was a vibrant place then. And she, he was saying that somebody told him that there is a new residential area. Uh, why don't we go and buy there? So he had he, his colleagues buying house there. So mm -hmm. we were there and we were, you know, we we grew up there. And then I went to Sri Aman, one of the prestige school also in PJ. So uh, in uh, after spending the younger age life there, uh, we move again to Tamanton, which is another <laughs> another elite uh, town, yeah, in, in KL. So, but still, I was going to school in PJ. You know, we were commuting again. So that, that's why I said our parents believe that if you want to go to a good place, you got to sacrifice. You know, like they sent us again from Tamanton to PJ. That's about 30, 40 minutes again. So, um, frankly, uh, being in a family who raised us to understand that there's always opportunity out there. My mom was, uh, you know, my mom when she was young, she was not privileged. You know, my grandfather doesn't believe in girls going to school. Yeah, so she yeah. stopped school at very young age, you know, like uh, uh, I think 12, she stopped. And that's where she starts having her... Her, how do I say, uh, her dreams to become somebody one day and to do something different. So when she got married, she was 20. So that's the time that I want to go somewhere and, and relieve something that is different. So she was a very strong lady from day one. She took care of us. She, she does everything like an educated woman, you know, and, and she is the first strength that I have actually. Why? Uh, in whatever situation you have, you got to explore. You got to do your best, and that's what she did. And she had eight of us. She was supporting my dad, doing everything. You know, like you know, at those times, seventies, eighties, like you sell, you do direct selling, party pirates. You know that kind of thing. You know, like <laughs> so she did everything for us. You know, uh, she to me. Uh, I was growing up with a father who believed that, uh, you know, there's no gender, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, he he wants you to go all out, you know. She, we, there are four boys, there are four girls in, in my family, eight of us. Mm -hmm. But uh, to me, when I look at my father, she, she, he always dreamed that uh, his daughters will go all out to become somebody. That's my father. And because of that, yeah, uh, it rubs to my mom. My mom believed that you can do anything if you want to. So they, they are very strong people when I was growing up. And another interesting story that I have is another pillar that I have behind me, uh, who is my twin sister. Uh. She's the one that really craft everything for me, actually. Um, I was always behind her. I'm her shadow because she's she's always the front one. You know, she's the one who shines. She is the one who opened the path for me. You know, she she's the the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, she will go front. She will you know bring the torch and lead me to the room. So she will be telling me things like uh, I want to do this, I want to do that, and then. It's just something like, okay, I will do it also, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> so, I mean, that that's how I started with my life, you know, from young. Yeah. Because, you see, when you ask how about your teenage life and everything, 
uh, it was easy for me because I have a friend from the womb, you know, like we, mm. were, <laughs> we were together. Now that's the best friend that you could ever get, right? And yeah. I was laughing. I was laughing when you said about Pyrex party. Those were the days it was a trend, yeah, everywhere you have gone. You know, you can never you can never miss becoming a, you know a, a, a dealer selling all those, right? For those who are staying here in Malaysia, we know this is our time. Exactly. Everybody will be selling, you know. Yeah, and it used to be fun because everybody will be bringing their curry pub and you know some stuff. For, for, for you know, it's always a party. You know, you can never yeah. miss that. So that was amazing. Yeah, you're right. And also, I like the part when you said uh, how uh, little little sacrifices that your parents did, and also uh, uh, when you said your mom uh, those days, uh, the dad didn't let her uh, study a lot. My mom used to say the same thing when she was studying. Uh, an uncle of hers came and said. Hey, why is your daughter studying? Because at the end of the day, she's going to end up in the kitchen. You know, exactly. those were the time uh, of people we had back then. And then things changed when especially your mom became uh, uh, pretty much your pillar together with your dad without uh, looking at gender, no gender bias, but still made sure that you were successful. That's an amazing story, isn't it? Well, if you look at them, yeah, they grew up totally in Kampo, you know. Every day is like a story from my mom, you know, how she grew up, how she just played, you know, from 12 to 20. Can you imagine eight years of playing? Just playing, nothing to do. But she's always ambitious, you know. My mom is always ambitious. She wants to yeah. become so many things that when the opportunity came to her to be brought, you know, to be, you know, just get out from the kampong and be in the city. She dreams of everything, you know, I, I can do, you know, she start driving, you know, like, a, like wow. a, you know, I want to drive, you know, that's her. I want to drive, I can do it. I want to sell, I can do it. You know, I want to do anything, I can do it. So, you know, because of that, you know, you you are always, you know, a challenge, you know, challenge to do. If she can do it, we can do it, you know, like if she is a woman who can, you know, who can, uh, who knows nothing, but is determined to do something. So probably, you know, unconsciously, uh, that drives inside us. Uh, oh, which, indeed. Yeah, which at this age, I can only confess at this age that I'm feeling that. Oh, else I wouldn't know, you know, where do I get the strength? Of I doing know, Iron yeah. lady, yeah? very nice, very nice, very nice. So yeah. you, you spoke about you spoke about your your twins, uh, but uh, your siblings are they still in contact with uh, with you? Uh, do you still? Oh, we have on everybody here. We we nice. are family, and it's always nice together. They uh, they are eight of us, but my twin sister. We used to be outside, you know. We used to stay outside, that half half like that, you know. Uh -huh. But now everybody has returned, except for my twin sister. She's still in Dubai. So we always look forward when she comes back. You know, it's always a gathering, and my mom and my dad will be the happiest lot. You know, when when everybody comes in, it will be a big crowd. Yeah. But um, in con contradict, yeah, I'm, I have only three. I never dream of having big. <laughs> I do not know. <laughs> I don't think I can manage like my mom. You know, my mom is like, um, I mean, she doesn't work. But she does all the, you know, that selling that takes her time. But then at very young age, she trained us to take care of our, you know, siblings. So that kind of responsibilities lead us to become strong. You can do anything. She would just like leave everything because we are the, you know, we are the, uh, I'm number second, number third. You know, my first sister, you know, being the first, always being compared, you know, like, Okay, never mind. She she is the sister. So the second and the third, we we were the one who take care of our sibling. And because my yeah. sister also uh, went for boarding school at that time, boarding school was like the must thing to go. You know, so she yeah. left early. She left early and then left with me and my twin sister as the elders. So we took mm -hmm. care of the whole of our siblings because my mom is as busy. You know, she, yeah. she go here and there. It gives her strength, so we let her do that, you know. So nice. that, that, that's the things that we we grow up with. Amazing, amazing. So, so the parenting style itself is totally different from what uh, uh, you have just shared. Yeah, uh, we thought that uh, when they are from the kampung kampung side, they will be very, you know, 
uh, illiterate, therefore they won't be able to be so open. But uh, they had a different type of parenting, don't you think so? I think sometimes, you know, when you have a different kind of mentality, because like my father, his parents are very uh, ambitious, I would say. Like my my mother's parents, she doesn't have a mother. You know, she doesn't have a mother. She was left when she was four, I think, by the mother. And she was like hopping, you know, from, from, from the household of the real father and stepmother from the grandparents, sharing house with cousins, that kind of thing. You know, she was growing up like that. Uh, it was n no opportunity at all. Nobody yeah. gave her the drive, but she was driven herself. You know, she she always talked about her childhood when she was young, how she wanted to do a lot of things. And she was like looking at people around her and dreaming big, you know. So actually sometimes, uh, your background will push you to another person. Sometimes uh, being not having things will also make you differently. So yeah. these are the combination that I have from my parents. Yeah. One is a supporting, uh, one doesn't give anything. So they are very strong, you know, in that sense. And and therefore we became who we are, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. Right. Ma'am, I have got a couple of uh, comments here. You have got fan base here coming, yeah? So Rajuin here says, well done, Warren and Datin. Uh, welcome. She's saying Rajuin call. Lim Vitim says, good evening, everyone. Uh, Razul Haq, uh, he's from Bangladesh, Dhaka. He says, good evening. Uh, Chef Gaya says, uh, selamat petang, Datin. Uh, and also she said she have shared this to a few groups. Yeah, so a lot of people are watching uh, here right now and a lot of comments coming. Also, we have got a lot of questions from many people. But I, I want to ask you that thing. I roughly spoke about you just now, uh, but we want to know you when you first entered the Alam Pekerjaan working life. What was your first job and what <laughs> else did you do? <laughs> your okay. experience? Um, actually, um, my first job, let's talk, let's go behind a little bit before I landed in the job. Uh, I did uh, a very, how do I say, in the 80s, eh, uh, late 80s, uh, I did my diploma in textile technology. Eh? It was a very uh, different program that people do not want to get into. And during that time, it was not my choice also. But um, I was given the opportunity. You see, like, like what I told you about my father, he's always a driven, you know, he, he sets up your, you know, what you're going to do. My twin sister was like, you know, she, she's always the, how do I say, yeah, the achiever, you know, like I will always follow her. But I did not do that well as compared to her. So she has already landed in University of Malaya. And my father was very proud of that. And she, he was like turning to me and say, now, what are you going to do? I was also asking the same um, uh, program, but I did not get in. So I say, I do not know what I'm going to do because I'm, uh, you know, it's like that. You know, I do not know what I, I want to do at that age. But my twin sister is very firm on what she wants to do. She knows very well. So my, my dad said, okay, she goes everywhere and he goes everywhere asking. So he he has a friend in UITM who's the dean of applied sciences at that time. And he came back and he said, okay, I've got something for you. I've got this program that you can go in. I've got a friend who can let you go in. It's called uh, textile technology. And I was looking at him, textile technology, what is that? You know, but it's textile, you know, I, I like I like fashion, you know, I, I like I like things that has got to do with clothing. I said, okay, I will try, you know, I'll just go in. So when I go in, um, well, the shop starts, you know, like uh, um, the place is so scientific, it's applied sciences, it's not fashion. Um, I said, well, what am I going to do here? And then they really drill you on the technical stuff, you know, the sciences. I was from science stream. I do not like all the chemistry, physics, bio. I do not like them, but I, I, I really had to do it, you know. And again, I went under this applied sciences where you go into the sciences again, the chemistry, the physics. But it was a better physics because the lectures was better than the school teacher that I had had. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm doing this. And then finally, I got to know that uh, it is really studying the behavior, the physical 
set of the fabric, you know, the characteristic of the fabric that we drill in the depth of, of the study. And during that time, there are only about 15 of us in the batch. For every batch, it's only about 15, you know, very little. And when we decided like after that uh, program, you got to go and attach yourself to a factory. And I did my first internship in the factory. I got ill. I had high fever for three days. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was in the city and then I went all out to Penang, a remote place, a factory. I've never gone through this kind of experience. I was with my parents all the time. So it was like really something that I really don't like. I said, I'm not going to end up in the factory when I graduated. So believe it or not, after I graduated, I never landed in my field, you know. I was with the travel agent. That was my first uh, my first job. I was also with Malaysia Airlines for a while because I was following my husband. He was attached to Malaysia Airlines. I said, okay, I go and work somewhere around what you do, you know. So I was with reservation for a while. And then... Um, after so many jumping, I said, this doesn't suit me. What am I going to do, you know? I don't want to go into the factory because I know factories are going to be outside from KL. I cannot bear going outside from KL. So there was an opportunity to further studies with a World Bank scholarship. And believe it or not, they have scholarship for degree for textile chemistry. Mm -hmm. so I said, I've got my diploma in textile. Why should I waste it? So probably I should just go along, you know. So I went again to a school who who I need to take all the chemistry again, you know. And uh, luckily enough, when I was in state, uh, there is an option elective that I can do fashion business. So that's where I start to have this kind of, you know, this... Um, the collaboration between the technical world, the scientific world with the business in fashion, and also the understanding of the fashion itself, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, after that, um, because it is a World Bank, it was with uh, Ministry of Education, uh, we were to come back and do the lecturing. So we were forced to do uh, master of Education, but it's a technical uh, education whereby you are trained to technically teach in the university. Mm. So, you see, I, I don't really have uh, a very long years of working. At the same yeah. time, my husband was traveling, you know, and yeah. uh, when I came back uh, from the degree, I was supposed to do master's. There he goes again and said, uh, you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot uh, go for your master's. I, I'm, uh, I'm going to be attached to U.S. Uh, I'm going to bring you. So I stopped my career there. And then when I came back doing my master's, um, not so long of attaching to UITM, he said, uh, you cannot, you know, you cannot work anymore. I, I'm going to go outside. So I was following him and I was abandoning my work. Uh, I was like supposed to be with him, but I also struggled to do my own things. So that mm. is my story. I don't really have a yeah. really, you know, a really uh, long uh, history of working. But you see, that's the beauty. You see, when you say you are saying that you don't have a long history of working, but I was uh, taken aback a little bit, and I have got some comments who are also saying, uh, like Sangri Krishnan says that uh, sweet memories to share. To share. And yes, indeed, because when you were talking, you were talking about how you were doing things like any other uh, woman, any other person, any other uh, student who just graduated and wanting to do something in life. And you were in Malaysian Airlines doing reservation and things that were so normal, you see. But yes. then you are who you are today because of the little, little things that you did. And the beauty is every path that you took brought you to a realization and then uh, you are who you are because of the little little journey that's the beauty that i see you see and that's very very interesting i must interesting yes definitely because you have the opportunity to do everything you know exactly um, i mean like to me i think uh, doing things that you like is very important but also exactly. realizing what you have as as a basic because i had my diploma in that technology if yeah. 
I do not like it. You know, I do not like to go into that field after I graduated. But then when I had the opportunity to further my studies in the same line, I took it, you know, because I thought, I think it is a waste, you know, of having that diploma. Why should I waste it? Although I did not use it, you know. I said yeah. that is difficult for me to advance my uh, knowledge and skill. So I went without even knowing that I'm going to end up again in that field or not. It doesn't matter, but the opportunity comes. So yeah. the thing is, when opportunity comes and not on your door, you've got to take it, you know. Okay. And, and you need to be intelligent enough to take it, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> you've got to be like smart enough to see that that will benefit in long run, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know one thing that is interesting, why did I say that? Because yeah. I was married at that time. I ah. left my husband. I left my husband. I was married. I got the opportunity. I said to him, I got this offer. I'm going, you know, without even thinking. And then after that, I was crying. I was telling my children every day. I will be telling my children that I regretted my decision because I took, you know, we were just married. You know, when we got married, he furthered his studies. He left me for a while, you know to further his studies. And then when he came back, it was my turn. He said, okay, it's my turn, I think. So he, we did not, you know, we did not um, uh, think that I would get the offer to go to US. It was about just two years after our marriage. And I said, I got this opportunity. You know, when I went for the interview, it was thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And only about 100 people got the uh, scholarship. I said, I, I want to go. I said, and the moment I fly, you know, the moment I fly, I said, I want to come back. I regretted my decision of leaving him. But then I moved on and do it for three years. But then it was also uh, a path whereby he was attached to the Malaysia Airlines. So I got free tickets to come back, you know, or else I wouldn't go, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, the exactly. But yeah. also the decision to be, uh, to, to, to do something that you need to do, you know, it's not it's not easy. Yeah. So, so I want to I, I want to sidetrack a little bit. When you said that your hubby was going for his studies, and then uh, when we spoke much earlier, uh, I remember you saying that there was a grace period of eight years. That was again going following him abroad. You know, that's why I said I don't have that many years of really working. You see. Uh, okay, when we came back, when I settled my degree and I moved out again to follow him for about a year uh, in US, and then we came back and we settled, we got our children, you know. I got my first kid after seven years, you know, because of this, this moving around, you know. So um, after that, we settled. I got my job as the lecturer at UITM. He was a licensed uh, aircraft engineer with... Uh, Malaysia Airlines and Asia. After so many years there, I was about to pursue my uh, PhD. Then he said, um, you know, he said, we got to go. You know, we got to go. So at that time, again, you know, I was like already weighing, you know, whether should I finish my PhD? How am I going to finish my PhD? And I don't want to be here in Malaysia and be left, you know. I got my three kids already at that time. So I said, I got to go and how do I juggle with my PhD? I almost dropped it, you know. I was what like, year was this? What year was this? This About was 2007, 2008 actually. Okay. Okay. And my sister, you know, my twin sister has completed her PhD. That was my drive, you know. Oh, she's uh -huh. doing it. I got to do it, you know. I got to follow her. So actually, I was asking her, should I just drop it? You know, I haven't really started anything. And then she said, if you drop it, it's also okay. But I said, I cannot because you have your PhD. I've got to have my PhD too. So it was like something that she's always my driver. You know, she's always like, yeah. you will give me the highest thing to do. And then I will be following her. So I said, okay, I'll do it, you know. So I brought my children. The first move was to Jakarta for four years. And I was struggling, you know, with my small kids. They were very young at that time. And I got them settled in, in the first year. I postponed a little bit of my PhD and going up and down. 
and it was an opportunity also that my husband got a job that is nearer you know that i can come down and i was persuading my supervisors and say please i need to go i will come down and meet you every two three weeks i'll come down you see so we were like doing that for almost two years i, I completed there and then when i set up something i was setting up a school in indonesia there my husband said we need to move again you know that's always yeah. a challenge <laughs> so we need to move again you know i was like having an affiliation with the greece academy so I, he said that we need to move again so i said okay we, we'll move so we move again to saudi for three and a half years so during that time yeah um i did not serve anything you know i completed my phd i i, I had to quit uitm because it was too long. It was only three years of, uh, you know, uh, non-paid leave, something like that. And then it was um, a decision whether you want to come back and teach and then we let you go again or you quit. I see if I go back and bring all my three children and if they don't let me go, what will happen? You know, I will suffer. I said, I don't want to come back. Mm -hmm. So again, I got to ask my husband, can I just quit? I, I don't want to be, you know, no, he, he, he said, just quit and do something else. So during these eight years here, yeah, almost like four and almost four years in Saudi, I was given the opportunity to do something by my husband, you know, because because for, for me, I can, I, I can just sit and take care of my children. But again, I said, I've got something that I have. Why should I keep it to myself? So that's where I start uh, building up schools there also and putting the system that I believe that is the best system. And we did some research there also in Saudi. So, yeah. After so yep. Yeah, sorry, you're saying? No, after spending something there in Saudi, it was about to start again. My husband said, I think we need to go back. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, that's the story actually. Yeah, so I'm I'm taking a deep breath uh, simply because uh, uh, you, you you had your waiting time, but you were not waiting or sitting quietly, but rather you were constantly doing a lot of things. See, this is uh, I'm I'm reflecting on the the pandemic uh, uh, season I call it that we have it's now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a long season that we have. But uh, uh, we have got people complaining that hey, I'm so bored. I don't know what to do. I've got uh, nothing to do. I feel and and, and there are uh, some who goes to the verge of even uh, committing suicide, taking their life, ending it, and and doing something else. But but uh, there are so many uh, things that you can do, and this is the opportunity you have got time and space for your own self. What do you want to build on? What do you want to learn? What do you want to expand on? You have got all the time in the world. And you did the same thing. And I asked you about the years just now. Why? Simply because I'm looking at some of your... Uh, whenever I bring in a guest or before, I Google that person uh, and I want to know that if they have got a story to tell. And I'm looking at your your Google Scholar list. Yeah, uh, Google Scholar list has got... Uh, your white papers, uh, uh, apparel sizing and design, sizing system for functional clothing, clothing yeah. for children, using data, 3D body, developing apparel sizing, and a whole lot more. And you have got from the many, many years. Now, for a woman to do all this, right, for a person to do all this, it's amazing. And, and, and I'm like, how could you do all these things? Where did you find the time? That's an amazing thing that you were doing, despite the many who, could, who would say, let's watch Netflix, let's lay apart a little bit. I've got children, let me take care of my children, because my blaming, my reasoning is, I've got my kid. You, you understand what I'm saying, Nathan? I don't watch TV. Yeah. <laughs> I don't watch TV. <laughs> well, I don't well that, that saved a lot of your time, I suppose. No, actually... Actually, is is the you know driven factor that you want to get to know a lot of things, and yeah, you're right. you can learn a lot of things actually by doing things that you believe that will give you more uh, things to share with people. Yeah, I think the driven factor is the the best thing that you have just said. Yeah, uh, I want to read some uh, viewers' comment. Kiran says, "Good evening." Um, mm -hmm. Kiran, and, and then you have got uh, Susan says. 
you are right grab the opportunity and then farisha datu minhat said that is such a brave sacrifice towards opportunities this is my dearest daughter in law here <laughs> ah, there you go there you go my life story come in and and listen to what i've done actually <laughs> so um, beautiful no because i think uh, in life yeah uh, i always tell this to my children do things when you are i mean you when you are at a time that uh, things are easy you know struggle when things are easy you know don't struggle when things are difficult because then the double dose of difficulties will come to you so yeah. while you are having time uh, you are at least uh, very comfortable you know comfortable meaning to say that you don't have to have luxury in life but as long as you have the basic things in life do do things then you know don't wait until things are getting worse uh, to to plan to do something and never don't do uh, planning like plan a b like that but always constantly doing things all the time so that you are prepared you know it's something like you you do a collection of money you know you collect as many as possible so that when you need it is there so there goes also for things that you need to do for life it includes knowledge it includes the skills and includes the professionalism so today we are talking about uh, the national agenda of how can you contribute to the nation you as a citizen you got to have this mentality because we are moving towards the era where everything is going to be competitive so when things are going to be competitive you need to start to think of how to save your nation so what what are you doing you know like you have the knowledge you have the skill but if you are not professional being yourself meaning to say that you are not willing to contribute that's being professional uh, really? you know have something then you contribute back to the nation that's being professional so this is a drive that i'm pulling to everybody as you know i always also say to my students uh your drive is to get as much as possible don't wait for your lectures to tell you don't wait for people to come and tell you do it you know uh, proactive and also having this how do i say this um mindset of wanting to keep on learning you know the driven mindset that should yeah. be in everybody i think the driven mindset that, that you spoke about many of times i think that's the beauty i've got imelda who says wonderfully spoken about the basics of life insightful yes indeed it was basics of life yeah that in usada fashion business secrets is the title of our show tonight yes fashion Let's business talk about secrets that. yes so tell us what this means to you and of course we are all waiting for you to share those little secrets of fashion business that in silakan okay um throughout my experience yeah, i am not a fashion business owner yeah? i've never done any business uh, business is not my forte i've been telling everybody from day one but what i have is the secret to the success in the sense of the knowledge uh, i've been in the academia for a long time and uh, i have the drive to drive people to do better uh, to educate people to know how to get the right resources the right resources here means the right knowledge the right skills in order for you to become the best entrepreneur yeah you need to have the product knowledge this is what i you know i've actually learned from the years of traveling all over the world being in the international society uh, being in the first world society this is how they are driven to become the first Uh, of the nation yeah because they are driven to find the right knowledge and when they do business uh, they are always very proud of the knowledge that they have about the product which doesn't happen in, in these countries you know because we are still labeled i do not know where we are actually in malaysia whether we are the second nation or the third nation mostly when we think about the overall probably we are still in the third nation but when we see our you know our city our building our development then we would we would say that we are second nation we we are not near to the third nation uh, you know development so we are actually a sandwich between everything 
but uh, the sad thing that I must say, the mentality of us, we need to grow. We need to be able to share whatever that we have. So as a fashion business, the secret to it is you need to be able to have technical knowledge, which is the product knowledge, and also the business savvy. You must have two or else you cannot, you know, fully become successful like what the First Nation are doing. You know, being in, in, in this business here, yeah, fashion business globally has thrived uh, for trillions of dollars. So if you are in this business, you are no wrong. You are already there. You know, you are in the right industry. You are in the right business because once you have the passion to be in the fashion business, uh, you can go everywhere. Everybody need fashion in this world. And when we talk about fashion, it's one of the basic needs. Uh, we are wearing clothing every day. And when we talk about the word fashion, you've got to understand the word fashion means that it is always moving. When it is always moving and changing, it means to say that your knowledge and your passion towards the product must be very intact. You cannot become a fashion business owner if you don't have the passion to understand the trend of the fashion. So that is one recipe, okay? And the other recipe is definitely to really appreciate your product. What is your product? Your product is uh, clothing or, or what we say, uh, the fashion itself. Yeah? So the difference between clothing and fashion is that clothing is a basic thing that you wear on your body. If it doesn't change, it means it's a basic clothing. If it's changing, the styles are always changing, that is considered a fashionable product. Of all the fashionable products that we have in the world, yeah, uh, clothing is the only item that people are really going for. And it has churned out trillion of dollars out of it. And it is being accepted by the world. So if you are in this uh, business, it means to say that you have the opportunity not only to do the business locally, but you can expand your empire to the whole world. You can, you know, you can offer people something that is authentic based on your cultural, your belief, your set mind. Right? So th these are the things that you need to explore as a fashion business. You've got to understand who you are, what's your root, what is your heritage, what is your authenticity, what is your originality, then you can bring your product to the world. And if you're going to bring your product to the world, you've got to really know the spec of it. You know, you've got to really know the ingredient well, you know, what is your raw material, what is the behavior, what are the acceptance of the international standard based on the material that is accepted out there. So you see, I, I'm talking based on maybe 30 years of knowledge uh, seeking on this matter. You know, you remember when I said I started with textile technology, it was not my interest, it was not, but I did and did and did. And when I was given the chance uh, staying with my husband abroad, the eight years, was a jam time for me because I had the opportunity to really go into the core, you know, from the surface up to the core. I've, I've, you know, I've covered the whole thing from fiber up to retail. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this is the drive that I want to give to everybody now. You know, if if you want to go really serious in fashion business, uh, you must first understand the technique technicality of it. You don't have to go so deep like what I've done, but then as a fashion business owner, you must understand what fiber you're using, what fabric you're using, what yarn give a quality product to your, uh, to your, uh, to the product that you're going to sell. And you must have the pride to sell the best. That's what the First Nation are doing. They have this policy of return everywhere there. If you are not satisfied with your product, return back. But here we don't have that yet because our knowledge on the product is very little. We, we don't dare, you know, to, to claim or to guarantee our product of a high quality because we do not know how to read the spec. So this is the problem that we are having here. And uh, it's, it's nobody's mistake. 
because even the education here are lacking all those. Yeah, so these are the things that I'm driven to move forward, uh, become part of the important policy maker in education to say that in my field, you know, it's a big field, uh, whether you are the designer or you are the fashion business owner or you are the producer, there are so many things that you need to really understand so that you become successful in your own thing that you do. If you are the manufacturer, you know them very well. That's what uh, I think one of the uh, word, the keyword that Warren has uh, um, mentioned in the early part just now is anthropometric, right, Warren? Yes. So anthropometric is actually the core ingredient for everybody to know. So it's very scientific. This is what I have discovered and I have already you know, been writing about this anthropometric at power with the gurus out there. Anthropometric is simply the scientific name for understanding of the body sizes and shape of a human. Uh, this is actually one of the important basic knowledge for engineering, which we call human factor engineering. Why do we need to understand the body sizes and shape? Because fashion people are to dress the people who own the different sizes and shape. And I think from one of uh, Warren's talk, uh, uh, one of the lady were talking, everybody's body was beautiful, remember? One of your... Yes, yes. all yeah. bodies are beautiful. Yeah, all bodies are beautiful. It means to say, if you are the fashion business owner or you are the tailors or you are the designers, without that core knowledge in the beginning, of understanding people come with different sizes, different shapes, different proportions. And that equals to clothing fit. Mm -hmm. If you do not understand these three aspects of the proportion of the human, how are you going to give them the best quality of clothing? So you can become the best designer. You can sketch anything. You can create a very fabulous collection. But at the end of the, you know, at the end of the day, if this collection doesn't fit the body of the people, it means nothing. The fit is gone down the drain. Your hard work is gone down the drain. Even the manufacturers, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's interesting what you are saying. Yeah. I, I I'm just quickly gonna ask you this. Uh, I, and I'm googling uh fashion, uh, famous fashion designers. Yeah. So you have got. Coco Chanel, you have got uh, uh, YSL, you have got Marc Jacobs, you have got Jojo Armani, and, and the list goes on, yeah? But yes. the question is this, uh, Datin, uh, can we Malaysians become them? Uh, what's lacking? Oh my goodness, we have talented people here. We have all the people. I'm happy to hear, yeah? I'm glad to hear that. Oh that, yes, what is Malay, missing? Malay, what's uh, missing? Look, that, that, the, there's no missing here yet, okay? okay? For those who have been successful, yes. Uh, we have very talented fashion designers. That one uh, is a thumbs up. Uh, we have all our designers also uh, moving out to, to give their services to the world. Okay, we have got two channels here, okay? One is the made to measure. Okay. Made to measure is of no problem as it is now because our fashion designers are all made to measure. So it means to say throughout time, they have the skill to produce good clothing for people out there personally, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we do not, we cannot compete with that many people because only talented people will go up to, will rise up to that few percentage of the designers that we have in Malaysia. Okay. But then for designers to become like that, it will be really highly competitive you know but there are other opportunities that they can uh, they can be in and for example become a fashion business owner okay mm -hmm. when you have a business that you can offer people to come and buy off the rack that's where the problem comes in uh, mm -hmm. when you do not understand the sizes and shape okay? okay and when you want to produce for different sizes and shape the skill is still not there so these are the things that uh, we must 
uh, start to educate and train people to understand the sizes and shape, to understand how to make the form for the body first before you transmit into the styling that they want. So these are the knowledge that I'm encouraging everybody to have or to master. Besides having, you see, in Malaysia, uh, we have a lot of institutions doing fashion designs only. When we talk about fashion design, it means to say that they are trained hardcore to only create collection. They do not have time, you know, to like do the, the technical part because that is the nature. Uh, and we have only one uh, technology base. Technology base means to say fashion technology, knowing the techniques, the process, uh, the uh, the system of how to build up a good product. We have only one in UITM doing this. So this is the reason why I am like going further and further to encourage everybody to convert themselves from fashion designers to become fashion technologies. And yeah. Uh, this is not something that you think after graduating of three years, you are set. Uh, this shouldn't be the mentality of the Malaysian. So this yeah. is the only thing that I'm encouraging people. Do not stop your learning only at certain phase. You know, when you have degree, you stop. When you have master's, you stop. Up until today, I, I, I haven't stopped learning. You know, I, I'm taking courses as I'm going, you know. Because uh, there's a lot to learn and you, you must be very smart to understand what you need. So when you become a successful uh, fashion business owners, you must ask yourself, okay, I'm dealing with this product. Uh, what else do I need to know about this product? What do I need to know about clothing? There's so many factors, you know. You, you need to understand the trend. You need to understand the fabrication, what fabrics you are going to use. You've got to understand the color trend. You got to understand the consumers. Who are your consumers? These are all, you know, the knowledge that you need to understand. And uh, you got to produce. Who are your suppliers? Who give you the best things? Who give you the most uh, high quality uh, ingredients so that when you uh, sell your product, you can uh, recommend or ensure that your product is of a certain quality. You know, like IKEA, they are so successful because they can guarantee the product to last how long? Can you, as a fashion business, say, okay, if you're going to buy blouse from my shop, I guarantee you with the fabrication, with the kind of stitches that we make sure people do on your clothing, you can at least wear three years without any damage, without any replay. That's so nice. these are the things, actually. These are the things that... Uh, uh, I did not say that fashion business owners here are not successful. They are very, uh, yes. there are many people who are who has been very successful. But, then, yeah. yeah. But if they really go into details, you can imagine how far they can go. They can go. And, you know, and that's beauty. Yeah? That's what you said. And, and it's very nice when I asked you uh, what's missing and you said nothing is missing. Yes, because we have got talented people here. The Me channels too. are available. You just need yeah. to find your niche and then move along with it. There are Definitely. so many areas that you need to look into. Uh, and I'm Googling the fashion designers in Malaysia. We have got Bernard Chandran, we have got Melinda Lui, people. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of people are doing it, but then uh, you need to find what's your taste. Where exactly. is it that you want to focus on and uh, proceed with whatever that you're doing? Where you have passion, that's where you will uh, be, find success. And and I've got a comment here uh, that then uh, Vivian Lee says, yes, sell a good product. Uh, the need of kindness like Datin uh, and uh, Warren, million thanks. You are, you are awesome. Datin, yes, uh, you have got your fan base increasing. Yeah, And I've got a message that, that came from... Uh, my WhatsApp, uh, Kamal from Langkawi is asking this question. Did okay. fashion business help you in your journey of life? I know you, you've answered a little bit, but could you... Uh, okay. um, actually, you know, uh, being in this background, you know, for, for, the, for the many years of my life, I, I think I, I always think that I, I landed in the wrong field, you know, like, what am I going... <laughs> I, I'm so technical, you know, I, I, I was not needed, you know, then. Everybody was talking about designing and I was lacking that. So towards the, the 
the last five years, I start to get myself into designing because design was never my forte. So uh, having technical knowledge, uh, very highly technology based uh, thing, and then uh, couple up with design has has made me realize that uh, the field of fashion business is is very very good. Uh, I am not a fashion business person, but I have been educating fashion business owners, you know, on how to set their their business in the sense that uh, giving them the input on the knowledge of the product itself. So mm-hmm. I do not know whether I answer uh, the question, yeah. but to me, I think um, being in this field as an educator can actually bring you to many different areas, you know, you can be the uh, manufacturers uh, themselves, you can become the business owner themselves. I, I mean, like if I've got the choice, I can become all this if I want to. But I think at this point, uh, I rather stick to become an educator or trainer because I think with the knowledge that I have, I can push people to understand what they need instead of becoming um, the person itself. As I inform you, uh, I have got no forte on business. I, I don't. I'm not driven by that, but I'm driven to tell people what they need. So, so we we can complement each other very well. I think by doing that. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, a message coming in uh, by the viewers. That thing is amazing. John Sundaresan Jayaratnam, uh, Julia Theo is saying, "Wow, I'm truly inspired." Uh, and Vivian Lee is saying, well said, learn from young until old, never stop learning. See, your fan base is growing. That thing I want to know, how do you keep up with the constant change in the trend? Because I know uh, it changes even as we speak now. So, that thing, how do yes. you keep it up? Um, I am with the international group of people. So, I follow forums all the time. So I am also being invited to listen to forums all over the world in this fashion business. That's how I get to know about the latest thing. So these are the things that I am motivated also to inform everybody here. If you are the fashion business owners, try to get yourself into this international uh, group of people, you know, subscribe yourself, uh, get into forums where people tell you what's happening in the world so that you are keeping abreast of what's happening and update your whatever business that you are doing. And uh, also, if possible, um, for everybody, doesn't matter whether you are a really renowned uh, designer that uh, you got to become really at that high top position. Even if you are a starter, I believe that everybody has its own originality. You have your own uniqueness that you can create something that you can push to the world. So with the advent of technology today, uh, we have the opportunity to penetrate the global market faster and earlier, you know, and easier. Because we are all channeled to sell our products on e-commerce. Uh, e-commerce can be tapped by everybody in the world. So there will be someone out there who's going to like your creation. So don't be afraid. So today's society are different uh, as compared to 20 years ago when we you know when when I was like learning and everything is so segregated if you are living in US so you think about your own market and even if you you see only the first world country are selling to the world but today it's is the transfers you know whereby the people in the first world are looking for authenticity so who can give them that kind of thing and, you know, especially us, we have our own originality, we have our own culture. Bring that up, you know. You've got to also bring up all your life story into your creation so that people will definitely choose you. So with this kind of, um, how, how do I say, yeah? you need to be very sensitive also to the world, what they need. Uh, let me think, uh, Let me tell you, uh, for fashion business now, there are only two that you've got to be sensitive. One is technology usage, how you can use technology to get your product at certain level. And one aspect that is really important for fashion industry is sustainability. So I would encourage everybody who has a fashion business now to convert yourself into sustainable fashion business companies. Because then only 
the world will be accepting your product if you are following the sustainability procedures. So slowly you can move towards that and we are supposed to become green people. We've got to be sensitive towards the environment. So fashion is one of the products that is so highly uh, talked about that it's not sustainable. So these are the things that you've got to like uh, be sensitive. And with that kind of knowledge, uh, being with the international society, uh, you know, you are driven. Uh, you are driven to do something different. Uh, and and believe me, that will give you the spirit and 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 the the belief that you can do it, which is okay. very important. Very nice. I have got questions after questions coming, and a lot of viewers. I have got a lot of people are saying, "I'm your fan now. I'm your fan now." Yeah. But I've got this question. I've got two questions that I want to ask uh, before we end because we are already uh, 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 at 9 p.m. Yeah. But uh, okay. these are the questions that is very important because uh, the topic is very interesting. A question from Menaga from Kuala Pila is: She's asking if a woman wants to venture into this arena of fashion business, what mm -hmm. she needs to know and do. Well, uh, firstly, uh, business, uh, to me, you can jump into it. But then, uh, my advice would be uh, having the right knowledge, you know. Uh, get some training in, in the sense of product development, at least. Understand the, the, the characteristic of the fabric that you want to take. Understand the trending. Uh, probably, if you have got no background in fashion, uh, come and have some, you know, samples of uh, introduction to fashion, things like that. And then business, definitely business, you've got to have your tactical business knowledge. And with that, with, with that kind of uh, training and courses that you can get, uh, probably it will spark the interest because doing fashion business, you must be strong uh, to deal with it because it's not the same with other kind of business because this is highly competitive. When it is highly competitive, you need to be on your toe all the time and you've got to be offering good stuff all the time. Uh, without any knowledge, you won't be able to do that. It's just something that you need to be, uh, you know, be guided towards what are the recipes to have a good fashion business, uh, uh, fashion business on your own, yeah? Okay, okay. My most important question to all women who have appeared as my guest here, here in my show. Uh, it is about women and discrimination. Have you ever experienced it in your life? That's it. No, not discrimination. What, whoever, I mean, whatever walk that I've gone through my life, I was never discriminated on, on gender. Uh, mm. It's always opportunity that you can get uh, the same uh, female or male. Very nice, uh, very nice. Yep. And I ask this question for a reason because a lot of times we have got some women who says that they are discriminated one way or another. And then uh, the bunch of people whom I used to talk to in the show, they always say that, hey, you know what? I was not discriminated. So it's all about perspective. Eh? It's how you look at things. I and if you so. see things positively, I think it's all about positivity. I've got a question from John Sundaresan who's asking, how do you stop poaching of animals meant for the glamour and beauty industry? But that's why I said, uh, uh, with the realization of the sustainability uh, issues, probably uh, the the industry will start to slow down on all this uh, agenda. You know, I mean, just that the realization of the uh, environmental, uh, the animals uh, used for the uh, probably fur jacket and everything, it, it will stop soon. As as we realize that the fashion industry is using a lot of this. So that's why I say, if everybody starts to move as a group of what we are thriving today, especially the environment, uh, we will start to realize that we are not going to use it anymore. So no worries on that. I yes. think it will, come. it will come. Yeah. And and Vivian Lee also said very nicely, the direction of the tree is determined by the wind, by the direction of the person. Is definitely, up Vivian. Definitely. <laughs> now, now, what I'm going to ask now is a bonus for you ladies out there. So I want to know if you could give away a few tips on fashion, like three magic tips. Uh, becoming fashionable? Yeah. Um, okay, uh, tips here. Yeah. First, you need to understand uh, your body shape. Definitely. How to look good 
in whatever body you have like what 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 you have said before uh, everybody is beautiful doesn't matter but also be be cautious of what you wear to me you know to me it's important the appearance it doesn't mean that you cannot wear anything but then you've got to be cautious not to just wear what people are wearing you've got to understand who you are you've got to understand your body if it suits it suits good if it doesn't don't try because it's not going to mean anything and you don't have to be like everybody and to in today's society you 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 can be different yeah so you need to understand uh, your body sizes and shapes so that everything that you wear will look good on you and definitely get to know your own personal aura you don't you know blend it with the trend but you don't have to wear the trend to me i don't believe in that because if you start you know uh, following people then we are also limiting the uh, business to just offer what is needed by people we don't want that we want to be very free in offering things that we think is good for anybody cho who choose to wear them so for fashion get to know your body get to know the latest trend get to know the latest color that suit you and wear whatever you want to wear because you want to wear them not because people are wearing them to me that that's all that i can talk about fashion yeah that's nice that's nice you spoke about body shape know your body shape get to know your personal aura yeah it's not about the trend and also wear what you want to wear because you like it that's amazing yeah that's amazing uh, hatia ismail is saying uh, congratulations dr sada my student this is my student <laughs> ah that's nice and john is saying thank you so much dr saada so and and a lot of messages coming uh, well that thing what you have shared just now was very enlightening and i am together with the many out there are blessed to have you in this show tonight uh, uh, is there a message to the many ladies and men out there who thinks that they can do just so much in life and should never dream big i think uh, my last advice to everybody out there who's listening or who's going to listen to this one i must say that um build your life uh, as it's supposed to be because we only live once in our life enjoy yourself the the very best because you need to believe that whatever you do in life will give the return to everybody around you so you must give the fullest you you don't stop yourself not doing things to the fullest because it's going to be a waste on you and enjoy everything that you do do not take it so hard but always be determined and and have a positive mentality because we need it you know uh, in coming years i think it will be more competitive for everybody so whether it's competitive or not as long as you believe that you are doing your best you will be there very nice that's, that's what i believe in life that's beautiful that's beautiful datin uh, dr nur saada terima kasih banyak banyak uh, you were simply amazing in telling us the fashion business secrets yeah uh, i am here together with the people out there wishing you many more success in your life and best of health yeah i know that you are doing a lot of community service to the drug abusers and also to the LG, lgbt group yeah uh, in in many ways possible touching loads of lives i mean uh, we are blessed to have you uh, sharing with us uh, whatever that you know thank you so very much thank you thank you for everybody who spend their time uh, listening to just uh, some some of the tips of the experience that i've gone through life thank you very much you're most welcome and a lot of people are saying love you love yourself and love everyone so thank you so much that it uh, sure. so uh, thank you thank you so uh, what was your excuse not to get up this morning ladies and gentlemen uh, it is very important yeah wait no more because you too can achieve so many things in life just by being simple and that's what datin said just now just by being simple but passionate you can get up in the morning and say mco lagi or yay mco lagi remember the eight years the eight beautiful years that datin had and she used it utilized it and we wanted to know what was the magic the magic was just simple 
the desire to learn. So the choice is always yours. Let us be the change. I am more than I think. This is Warren here signing off. Meet you again, same day, same time next week. Bye. Thank you so much, Tadin. Thank you. Tadin, hang in there for a while, yeah? Okay.